Thank you for coming. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I, uh, I practiced psychotherapy for quite a few years, uh, specializing in working with people with chronic medical conditions. I also worked with uh, people with, um, who were cancer survivors. And it was very meaningful for me because I live with a number of chronic illnesses and I have lived with chronic illness all my life. Most of us with chronic illness have some form of either pain, physical disability, fatigue, malaise, some combination thereof. Um, so I worked with people to help them develop skills to improve their quality of life despite the pain or the fatigue or the malaise. So I got very frustrated. That's supposed to be the look of frustration. I don't know. <laughs> um, because I was doing everything right. I was eating the perfect diet. I was exercising, getting enough sleep, doing all the right things. I wasn't smoking or drinking or doing anything bad. And yet, uh, I was living with considerable pain, fatigue, disability, uh, malaise, a lot of days, just wasn't feeling well, had to cancel things at the last minute. So out of frustration, I started doing research. And I started looking at studies to see what's known beyond, everyone talks about diet, you know, it's what you eat and exercise. Yeah, but what if you're already doing that? There's gotta be something more. So I, I did a lot of, I started studying, reviewing all the literature to see what else is known. I discovered a lot of different things and I started putting them together and calling them mindfulness-based mastery and well-being practices. So I'll just break that down, what I mean by that. So mindfulness refers to living in the present moment, not getting caught up in, in all our thoughts. Um, most of us spend most of our time either planning for tomorrow, what are we going to be doing tomorrow, or worrying about something that's going to be happening six months from now, or that may not even happen, or um, just thinking about something that happened in the past. And we spend so much time thinking about the past and the future. So mindfulness is a practice, a meditative practice, where you learn to live more in the moment. The mastery there are a number of behaviors that I'll be talking about that help us develop mastery. But um, So I'll leave that for now. Well-being is just a sense that we are in control of our lives, that I'm doing all I can do, and, I'm, and I can meet the challenges that come my way. So that's what I mean by well-being. This is George Leonard. George Leonard was an Aikido master. Um, and I'm going to read his quote. Uh, he wrote a book called Mastery. And in the book, I saw at one point he said this. He said, in order to achieve mastery in any endeavor, we must become masters of practice. A master of practice is someone who practices for the sake of practicing itself as opposed to achieving an end goal. This is a, a philosophy that's common in, in the martial arts, especially the Asian martial arts, uh, where you're not practicing to get somewhere down the road. You're practicing just for the sake of practicing. And I find this is very appropriate for those of us living with chronic illness because I know in my case, I have two forms of autoimmune disease ankylosing spondylitis, and ITP. It's a, a bleeding disorder, uh, also autoimmune. I also live with a, a, a primary immunodeficiency. So my body doesn't, my immune system just isn't as strong as the normal person's immune system. I've also lived with a lifelong, very severe malabsorption syndrome. And the problem with malabsorption is if you're not absorbing your nutrients from the food. It doesn't matter how good a diet you eat. If you're not absorbing all the nutrients in the food, then you're not making the proteins that you need to have a strong immune system or to do other things. So one of the results is I have very, very severe osteoporosis. 
You have to be very careful not to fall down. So I realized, okay, there, there are no cures for what I have. There are no cures for most of the really hundreds of thousands. There are actually hundreds of thousands of different types of chronic illnesses. And there are no cures for most of them. So I thought, well, if there are no cures for them, and there isn't a lot of hope for getting better, in fact, most things progress, progressively get worse, then what can we do to make life better? Living in the moment and taking on certain behaviors, which I'll be telling you about, to live with mastery. And I found that's, I think that's the only way to go. This is one of my heroes, Stephen Hawking, theoretical physicist. The quote isn't his. The quote at the bottom was from Josh Billings, but I really, I think this quote exemplifies Stephen Hawking. Life consists not in holding good cards, but in playing the cards we're dealt to hold those well. And I put his website up there just because he, he blogs, he, he uh, corresponds with people. You can write to him, he'll, he'll respond. The only way you can communicate, you can see on his eyeglasses, there's a little thing that detects incredibly slight movement that allows him to operate his computer. I mean, he can't move the rest of his body. And he's he has lived with um, this muscle-wasting disease, ALS, for almost, next year it'll be 50 years he's lived with this, which is pretty amazing. And he's not just living with it, but he's living a productive life. So he's someone who motivates me. This is Michael J. Fox, the actor who's been living with Parkinson's disease. Again, the quote isn't his, it's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. What lies before, behind us and what lies before us are small matters to what lies within us. Again, it's about taking charge of your life as Michael J. Fox has done. I'm sure you've, you've seen him in interviews with the struggles he's having. Christopher Reeve, another one of my heroes, um, living a normal life and then all of a sudden he's quadriplegic. There's a quote by, again, someone else, uh, Bruce Lee, the, uh, the Kung Fu guy. Uh, Bruce Lee, but it, it epitomized Christopher Reeve's life. Bruce Lee said, to hell with circumstances. I create opportunities. And I just really love that because that's how Christopher Lee, Christopher Reeve <clears throat> lived his life. This is one of my mentors who said, the human mind is the most underutilized and poorly utilized health resource available to us. Again, most people look at diet and exercise, they don't consider the mind. So this couple is not using their minds. And a fatalistic attitude, as they have, is, is like the opposite of mindfulness-based mastery and well-being. This is another one of my mentors, Dr. Jean Octoberg. And what she's talking about here, she was a psychophysiologist. And what she's saying basically is that every thought, every feeling we have affects our physiology. So that's why it is so important to work with the mind. My wife and I were staying in a motel in Blythe, California a few years ago. It was really hot. And so we needed to leave the air conditioner on all night because it was just terribly hot. But the compressor kept coming on all night, making a racket. Every time the air conditioner would come on, it would wake us up out of a sound sleep. So not only was it waking us up, we were getting angry. And it's hard to sleep when you're angry. So I suggested, why don't we pretend that that sound is our pet dog, Pluto? So the compressor of the air conditioner kept coming on all night, waking us up. But the difference is, instead of getting angry, we thought, oh, well, that's just Pluto. And it's nice to hear Pluto. Uh, so, so that's Pluto on the right. Same air conditioner, but we assigned a different attribution to that sound. And we were able to, we still woke up, but we were able to sleep a lot more because we weren't getting so angry. Another one of my mentors, 
Uh, I trained for three years at the Simonton Cancer Center. Dr. Verga worked with Dr. Dr. Simonton, and one day I heard him say this, that there's no drug that works as fast as changing your mind. A lot of cancer patients hear this from their oncologists. No doctor should ever make a prognosis. Doctors should share the diagnosis. Patients need to accept the diagnosis. But to tell someone you have three to six months to live, I mean, you can, if you look at a patient's eyes, he went into a trance, and that's typically what happens. So this is a man who was given a death sentence. He, he was diagnosed with a very advanced osteosarcoma. He was told he just had a few months to live. The quote is actually by Patricia Norris of the Menninger Clinic. But he was told he had a, just a few months to live, and, and he, didn't, he decided not to take that on. He accepted the diagnosis. He actually was a, um, he was a doctor, so he knew osteosarcoma meant a death sentence um, since it had already metastasized. So he accepted the diagnosis, but he refused to accept that he just had a few months to live. He decided, he actually announced, I'm going to see if I can be the first person ever to, to beat this disease. That was over 40 years ago. He's still alive and well and running the largest cancer center in Australia. Basically, one thing all these people have in common is they learn to experience bad news as a challenge rather than as a defeat. So this is William Osler. He's the father of modern medicine. Ask not what disease the patient has, but rather what patient has the disease. Dr. Osler um, started the first program at Johns Hopkins when they first opened in the 1880s. And up until that time, there were no residents. You'd go to medical school, but there was no residency. He started the first residency program. And he taught his med students and his residents to not give a prognosis. He taught them diagnose. But the prognosis has a lot to do with who is this patient? Maybe the patient's like that last man, Ian Gallman. And so you can't make an accurate prognosis. And when you do, you take away all hope. This is William James. William James taught physiology at Harvard and then created the field of psychology. The field of psychology didn't exist before this. Um, so he taught physiology, psychology, and physiological psychology at Harvard, and philosophy. He was way ahead of his time. In fact, over 120 years before science could prove it, he taught that we don't have to be the victim of our environment, that what we do with our minds affects our physiology. When I was at the Simonton Cancer Center, we helped them, we helped the cancer patients to adopt this type of attitude. It's not positive thinking. Positive thinking is, oh, I'm going to beat this. That's unrealistic. But realistic thinking is, if I'm doing all the right things, I'm more like, I'm certainly going to do better. Another empowered patient. I refuse to be a passive victim of my diagnosis. This is Norman Cousins. He's most well known for his book, Anatomy of an Illness. Uh, Norman Cousins had, was, had a very acute and fatal form of ankylosing spondylitis. He, when, while he was in the hospital, he realized that a hospital is a terrible place to be when you're sick. So against medical advice, he checked himself out of the hospital. Actually, what happened is he had a lot of friends in the movie industry, and they were bringing him uh, candid camera episodes and um, Charlie Chaplin movies and Laurel and Hardy movies. And the problem was that the hospital complained he was causing too much of a commotion. All the nurses were hanging out in his room, and the hospital didn't want that. So he checked himself out of the hospital and into a hotel room. He spent every day watching, laughing all day, every day. He fully recovered from this disease that was supposed to kill him. There's a way you can convert fear into curiosity, and I, and I recommend, I work with that all the time, trying to do that. It's very common when someone's diagnosed with an advanced 
disease or any life-threatening disease to think it's going to kill me. So it's normal to have those thoughts. I know this cancer is going to kill me. It's perfectly normal to have those thoughts. The goal is to find a way to not be so entangled with the thoughts so that those, that thought doesn't rule your life. This, that actually makes everything worse. This is uh, probably my most influential uh, mentor, Dr. Carl Simonton, who started the Simonton Cancer Center. If you want to be healthier, you need to think healthier. So we often helped people at the center to become more conscious of, of their thoughts. This is Moshe Feldenkrais. He suffered a, a traumatic knee injury, and he was told he'll never walk again without open knee surgery. He might not even walk even with the open knee surgery. He refused the knee surgery, and he, he discovered that through experimenting in how he walks, he could continue to walk. And, and he died well into his 80s, I think, still walking. So he proved the doctors wrong. And he, again, is one of my heroes because I've learned that I have to keep experimenting um, with everything, with diet, with exercise, walking. When I'm in too much pain to walk, I, can, I keep experimenting with how I'm taking my steps. And so he's, he had modeled that for me. So become a, a self-researcher. I've conducted a lot of studies with an N of one, and only one person in the study. I'm it. So I'm the researcher and I'm the subject of the study. The practice I want to recommend more than anything is mindfulness practice. And it's, the formal practice is sitting in meditation. Uh, one very simple practice is you just focus your attention on the sensations of respiration. Now, you can focus on anything. There are people who focus on a candle flame. The problem is then you have to carry the candle around with you everywhere. Uh, also, um, the thing is, we're breathing all the time, so we can always tune into the sensations of breathing. And as we're doing this, the attention wanders. It's normal. But what we do is we notice, where did my mind go? And then I just come back to the focus, the sensations of breathing. It's, that's it. That's mindfulness practice. The man on the left is not practicing mindfulness. So he's saying, in saying I'm depressed, he's more likely to be depressed. The man on the right is having the, the feelings you would label as depression, but he's not buying into it. He's saying I'm having the thoughts, or he might be having the feelings that you equate with depression, but that's different than saying I'm depressed. This man is saying I'm feeling sad and it's probably because I was just entangled with some negative thoughts about my condition. So that's the result of mindfulness when we can step back and see that, oh yes, I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling afraid or I'm feeling angry and it's just, it's just my thoughts. I don't have to get caught up in it. <laughs> so this med meditator is demonstrating the Burmese posture. You know, some of us have bad backs and it's hard to meditate in that position. So this meditator is demonstrating you can meditate lying on your back. The idea is to get to a point where you can see your thoughts as if they're just clouds floating across the sky. So when we watch these big puffy cumulus clouds floating across the sky, we're not by, we're not upset about that. We, we enjoy watching them. So if we can get to the point, and this is the goal, to get to the point where we can actually see our thoughts just floating by without buying into them. So this is a very simple mindfulness practice. Just stop whatever you're doing for just a moment throughout the day. Tune into your breathing. That is, tune into the sensations of breathing. Whether you feel it, the air going in and out of your nostrils or the abdominal uh, cavity expanding and contracting. Just tuning in to whatever it is you're feeling. And feeling f emotions, whatever's there. And then just go back to whatever you're doing. This is one extreme. and certainly isn't necessary, but there are people who live a monastic lifestyle and basically they're just meditating or working uh, in the monastery all day. Um, but always 
meditating throughout the day. This is a, a tool that can be helpful. There are apps available for mobile devices where you can set alarms to go off throughout the day. And I've done this. Every time an alarm goes off, it just serves as a reminder to tune into my breathing, tune into my thoughts, my feelings, what am I feeling? And then just go back to what I was doing. But just, it's a way of reminding ourselves to practice mindfulness. So whatever activity we're doing, um, it's, it's great to get thoroughly immersed in the activity. So if you're doing the dishes, like this mindfulness practitioner, get thoroughly immersed in it. Now this is someone who, in case you get the, it's pretty bright, so I'll just show you what's here. So she's holding her cell phone under her chin. Her chin is, is actually holding her cell phone. She's talking to someone. Her right hand is holding a bagel. Her left hand, no, she's driving a car. Her left hand is holding her coffee. Her pinky is steering the car. <laughs> so I, a lot of people live this way. It's not how I want to live. This is how I want to live. <laughs> Paying full attention. Now this is the driver. This is how you want to drive. So learn from this driver. Um, so we feel most alive when we're thoroughly immersed in the activity at hand, whether it's driving or whatever it is. One of the drawbacks to a lack of mindfulness is we can find ourselves getting into very heated arguments with people from time to time. And without mindfulness, we're totally caught up in the argument. It's hard to step out of it when, when we just see the other person is wrong and we're just stuck on that track. With mindfulness, we can stop finger pointing, we can begin to see our thoughts instead of being caught up in our thoughts. And then we can choose healthier behavior. Another my, one of my mentors, uh, Lawrence Lachan, who pretty much invented the field of psycho-oncology, he was a psychologist who worked exclusively with cancer patients. Um, in fact, Dr. Simonton, who I showed you earlier, he considers Dr. Lachan his mentor. Um, so he found that when people learned self-expression, when they learned to sing their own song in life, they tended to recover at a higher rate than when they weren't able to do that. So authentic self-expression involves courageously expressing our honest feelings. And I say courageously because sometimes it's really hard to do that. You know, we're afraid of getting shamed or criticized. Uh, maybe we're afraid um, the other person will be hurt or angered by what we say. However, expressing our honest feelings is really good for our health. Defensiveness is the other, the other extreme. That's the weak position, whereas authentic emotional expression is associated with mastery and well-being. Now, another thing that correlates with good health, another mastery practice. So these are all the mastery practices that I've been talking about. And this is one more of the mastery practices, asking for a favor. So, so this hospitalized patient is asking her friend for a favor. And people who ask for favors do better. They just, they recover at a faster rate. They may not recover, but they, they live a fuller life. In the 90s at UCSF in San Francisco, they did a lot of studies with AIDS patients and with cancer patients. And they found that the, the patients who were not able to say no to a request. So if a friend asks you for a favor, you don't feel like doing this favor. Your ability to say no actually can improve your health. The people who had, a hard, had the hardest time saying no to a request um, had a poor outcome. I'm a big, big proponent of group therapy. I, I believe that, first of all, group therapy is one of the best ways probably the easiest way to develop all these mastery practices that I'm talking about. It's unlike individual therapy because it, it, you have usually about eight patients in the room with one to two therapists. So things come up 
certain parties in the group get into arguments, and there is a, a group leader there who can help the group members to learn the skills that come in handy in the outside world. Also, group therapy is far more cost effective than individual therapy. It's not always possible to find good group therapy. So individual therapy, I do recommend if you can't find group therapy, especially if it's mindfulness based. This is another one of my mentors, James F.T. Bugenthal. He is known for having brought existential humanistic psychotherapy to North America. It was big in Europe, and he and Rollo May made it big here. And his big thing was about choice. And so choice is another mastery in well-being practice. Um, making choices based on our deepest personal life values has been associated with improved health. Dr. Ellen Langer is a psychologist at Harvard. She's done a lot of studies in nursing homes. And typically what she did in a lot of these studies is they went into a nursing home, she and her team, and half the people in the nursing home, the half on the left, were given choices. They could choose pretty much everything that went on during the day. The, half, the other half of the nursing home residents had the choices taken away. They were told what they'd be eating, what movie they'd be seeing, and so forth. When she and her team returned a year and a half later, the death rate was higher in those residents who didn't have choices. The, the stress hormones were lower in the choice group. The, the choice group was happier. The longevity was double. The longevity of the choice group was double longevity of the other half, which is pretty remarkable. This study has been replicated, and um, the references are, you can just Google Ellen Langer, and you'll see all her studies with the references. So a year and a half later, the choice group is, is proactive, whereas the non-choice group hadn't learned to be proactive. This is the look of confusion, and the reason is, and I want to say this to you and see how this sits with you. I like to tell people, never do anything you don't want to do. And it sounds like a pretty provocative statement. But I'm just curious. I'd like to ask you, any of you, um, how that statement sits with you. If I say to you, never do anything you don't want to do, does that, does that make sense? It's, often people say, well, that's ridiculous. I have to go to work. And I say, no, you don't. And they say, well, of course I have to go to work. If I don't go to work, I can't pay my bills. I'll end up homeless. And I say, but you still don't have to go to work. You don't have to ever do anything. I say, that's your choice. You can choose to be homeless or choose to work. You know, even kids, they don't have to go to school. They're required to go to school, but, you know, they could decide to play hooky. Now, if they decide to not go to school, there will be consequences. But they don't have to go. They can choose to suffer the consequences. So even as, as kids, we can, we can choose, well, certainly as, as adolescents, uh, from that point on, we can choose everything. So I just had this idea, you know, sitting at a lunch counter or ordering this. I've had to go in for a lot of invasive diagnostic and treatment procedures, mostly at UCSF. And the night before, the morning of, I always find myself thinking, oh, I have to go in for this thing. As soon as I start thinking that way, I have to go in for this awful procedure. Um, the stress sets in, the fear sets in, that's really not good for my health. So I really work at choosing and smiling about it and appreciating, having gratitude for this invasive procedure because the invasive procedure gives us information, if it's a diagnostic procedure, if it's a treatment procedure, I'm grateful that there's a procedure that might help me. That's a much better attitude and is much better for our health and quality of life. So there are always 
always choices. Mastery includes the awareness that we have the great power to make choices. If we're not feeling well, if we're really feeling sick, sometimes we need an advocate. One of the beauties of mindfulness is it allows us to detect prodrome. Prodromes are early, very early, subtle symptoms that you normally wouldn't even pick up. And the advantage of mindfulness practice in allowing us to tune into these very early signs and symptoms is it's much easier, treatment is more effective for everything the earlier we're diagnosed. Taking charge of your life. So throughout the day I recommend every time you find yourself thinking have to, change it to I'm choosing to or I want to. There's another one of my mentors, Dr. Eric Pepper. I, I heard him say, I was sitting in a lecture of his one day and I heard him say, the limits of our experience and potential are the limits of our beliefs and I just love that because that ties into what I had learned from Carl Simonton at the Simonton Cancer Center. Um, if we're having very limited thinking, that's going to affect how we live. There's another one of my mentors, Dr. Jim Gordon. He's a psychiatrist who started the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C. And what's unique about the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, it's all done, they work in groups. And I mentioned earlier, I'm a big proponent of group therapy. I love groups. But they focus really on, on skill building. The Dalai Lama, happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from your own actions. He's saying the same things. He's talking about finding inner peace. Instead of looking for it from external sources, to look for it from within. And that's what Jim Gordon, Dr. Gordon, was talking about. It's about skill building. The Dalai Lama encouraged monks to go to the US to participate in studies. And this is one of the monks um, that, a nice thing on his head, those are EEG sensors, electroencephalography. This is an EEG cap where they're measuring brain waves. They measure brain waves while they're meditating and when they're not meditating. And they've discovered some very interesting things through not only EEG but uh, brain scans where they've actually discovered that the brains of the monks have evolved. I mean, this is 15 years ago, this would have been considered science fiction, I think maybe even 10 years ago. And now they know, they've proven that um, if you live basically the way I'm prescribing, <laughs> uh, you will evolve your brain. Uh, I wish I could say my brain has evolved. I <laughs> haven't experienced it yet. Um, and I, I'm not practicing to the extent they do. They practice many, many hours a day. So this is something else. Meaning and purpose is another mastery practice that I recommend. It's really important. And this is very hard to do when we're living with a debilitating chronic illness, to find meaning and purpose. Because very often, people living with chronic illness can no longer do what they were doing for career, for recreation, they can't, just can't do what they used to do. But it's important to find a way because meaning and purpose is essential for quality of life and for health. So ask yourself, what am I doing that provides me with a sense of meaning and purpose? And how can I have more of it You know, as you go through your day? Candy Leitner, her daughter was killed by a repeat drunk driver. The way she dealt, the way she used her grief she used it very positively, and with enormous resolve, she created MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Thanks to Candy Leitner and other people who've, who are working with her organization, um, they have changed DUI laws, and they've gotten a lot of repeat drunk drivers off the road. Um, but the, way I, the reason I'm mentioning this is because it's important to find meaning and purpose. So in her case, she, she took her grief from her daughter being killed and used that grief, channeled her energies into finding meaning and purpose in a way that saved a lot of lives. So if, if tragedy has struck you or strikes you, do what Candy Leitner did. Find a way to, to work with that. Um, again, Michael J. Fox on the left, Nancy Reagan on the right. Nancy Reagan is another one who channeled her grief um, when her husband, President Reagan, was 
diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she fought hard for embryonic stem cell research at a time when it was very difficult to fight for, science, for medical research. And um, so she's someone else who has, has channeled her grief into finding new meaning and purpose. I personally, um, I've had a number of MRIs and I'm claustrophobic. So for me, going into that little tube is very difficult. But it's important to be proactive and to find a way to handle it, whether it's through mindfulness or guided imagery, to do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, this is an elderly gentleman who has found meaning and purpose at the end of life, especially at the end of life or, at, or after suffering with a, a, chron a debilitating chronic illness. It's important, even if you can't change, maybe you can't go out and do some new activity, but you can find meaning and purpose by redefining your life by exploring what, what have I done in my life and finding appreciation for that. So the caption here, I've been, a, I've been a good husband, father, and physician. I've made a difference in the world. It's really great at the end of life to be able to look back and see that you've made a difference in the world, whether it's through your children and grandchildren or, or through your career or whatever. It improves, I mean, we all die, but it improves the quality of death. To, to die knowing you've made a positive difference in the world. So we have here three musicians playing to people in a, someone's backyard. And I'm pointing out that they're doing more than just playing music. They're doing a number of mastery practices. They're working on a group project. Working on a group project, being in community is really important. And working together on a group project has been found to be an independent variable that correlates with better health. So they're in community, they're socializing, they're contributing to the joy of others. Those are all things that are independently correlated with better health outcomes. And as they practice each one of these things, they're reinforcing healthy neural circuits because every time we practice a behavior, whether it's good or bad behavior. We are strengthening the neural pathways, the neural circuits for that behavior, which makes it more likely that we will engage in that behavior again. Dr. Kenneth Pelletier is a researcher at Stanford who focused on, on this very thing about community. And he said social support may be one of the critical elements distinguishing who remains healthy from who gets ill. It's that important, as important as food and shelter. So find people, it's important to find people to be around. When I was at the Simonton Cancer Center, um, we encouraged people to stay away from people in your life who don't, who bring you down. There are people who are toxic to be around. Especially if you're living with a chronic illness, it's important to stay away from toxic people and seek out people who, who you feel good being around. There have actually been a number of studies where they found that, in this case it was a study of older people, elders, and they found the elders were 22% less likely to die over the 10 years of the study if they were in a large circle of friends. And they, con by the way, they controlled for all the variables, bad habits, uh, everything. And after controlling for all the variables, they found this was what really stood out. Having a large circle of friends made the difference. You lived longer. This was a very impressive study. 3,000 breast cancer patients, all of whom happened to be nurses. And they found that the nurses with the breast cancer, who did not have a close circle of friends, had a death rate four times that of women who had a close circle of friends. In other words, the nurses with close friends had one quarter the mortality. I mean, that's pretty astounding. That, you know, we think of chemotherapy and, and all these things, but 
just it's we don't doctors don't recommend you you should find yourself a close circle of friends it's it's that it's extremely important the studies prove this so attending a class getting involved in any activity uh, is important look for opportunities for companionship social support community meaning and purpose they, these these mastery practices can all be combined in one fun activity. And it's especially important, again, for people with chronic illness and for elders at the end of life, when there aren't as many opportunities. But there's always something. Support groups are a great way of finding community. There are support groups for every imaginable type of chronic illness and life-threatening illness. Serving others is another mastery practice. Doesn't matter what you do, you don't have to save the world. Just, just having an open heart, reaching out to help people. Something as simple as opening a door can make life better for others, and in making life better for others, even if, even if we don't make life better for others, just having the intention to do so improves our quality of life. Gratitude is another mastery practice. So I recommend having a formal gratitude practice. For a long time I did this, where I would lie in bed um, thinking of three things for which I had gratitude. I could feel physiologic change. You know, one minute I'd be worrying about what I was going to be doing that day, and the next minute I'm having such gratitude for people and situations. Self-acceptance is another mastery practice. Now, a lot has been written about self-acceptance, and the way I talk about self-acceptance is you develop self-acceptance by accepting all of your experiences. So our thoughts, our feelings, emotions, sensations, we tend to think some are good and some are bad. Self-acceptance comes from accepting all of it because they're all part of us. They're all part of our experience. My research came from the fields of psychophysiology, psycho-oncology, psycho-neuroimmunology. Sometimes I felt like this. I, was, I reviewed a lot of science journals, uh, peer-reviewed, refereed journals. Um, and so it sometimes felt overwhelming. There was so much data out there. I actually didn't look at paper very much. It was mostly done on the internet. A lot of, these are just some of the references I have. They're all up on my website. Um, I want to leave you with uh, just a couple of uh, more quotes. Because, this, because William James is, again, someone who really models for me how to live. Compared to what we ought to be, we are only half awake. And we awaken to our potential by drawing upon heretofore untapped inner resources. He was way ahead of his time. There was no one talking or writing about mindfulness. He was, he was teaching at Harvard in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. He helped me to uncover the mindfulness and well-being practices. By the way, this is William James' godfather, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Experience is not what happens to us. Experience is what we do with what happens to us. So. Terrible things happen to us throughout life. It's guaranteed. If we live long enough, terrible things happen to us. And sometimes it happens in childhood. Sometimes it happens in their 20s. Sometimes it's, some people are lucky. Nothing terrible happens until they're in old age. But sooner or later, terrible things happen. But what matters, we can't change the things that happen to us. We have no control over that. What we do have control over is what we do with that, with our minds. So I just want to leave you with this last one. This is John Kabat-Zinn. John Kabat-Zinn said, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. This is a person surfing. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is most known for having created mindfulness-based stress reduction known as MBSR. And it's the way I recommend, it's the easiest way to learn mindfulness practice. It's just an eight-week class. and. You don't have to buy into any of the Buddhism, although a lot of people like that. The other way to learn mindfulness practice is to go to a Buddhist mindfulness center. So I want to thank you for your attention and um, invite you to visit my blog, 
I post to my blog three times a week. Every Monday I post an article that I've written. Wednesdays are interviews. Interv I interview people and some people interview me. The interviews are all up there in video interviews. And Fridays, I have a new column of Q&A. It's an advice column for people with chronic illness. So, so thank you. Oh, I think we probably can have some questions in this conversation. Do you feel uncomfortable about having the video cameras rolling?